All right, good morning so far to everyone that I can see here. It's good to have you back. It is officially eight o'clock, so we'll go ahead and we'll get started. Um, this whole thing will be recorded and put on YouTube anyway. Uh, I have one quick comment before uh, we, we start the actual material. Uh, I think Zoom has changed the way that they do the recording thing. So uh, y y after I uh, end the meeting and, and uh, convert the video, uh, your faces are visible. So I, uh, I did not post a, did not post last lecture uh, as a searchable video on YouTube because I, I didn't know if, if some of you who did have your cameras on uh, didn't want your faces on YouTube. I have, I have no idea. I didn't ask you uh, that beforehand. So if you don't want your faces on YouTube, um, go ahead and turn your camera off. Uh, that's that's not a problem with me. You can um, always chime in with chat or uh, by turning your microphone on. But if you uh, if you don't care, if maybe that's the kind of exposure that you want, you know, you're trying to grow your own channel or trying to I don't know increase your popularity somehow, then I, you know I suppose that you can keep your video on. That's fine. I'll keep mine on for all the before reasons. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, so again, if if you don't want your video on for the meetings, you don't have to have to have them on because your you know your uh, your video will be up on YouTube. Okay, so I leave that to you. Um, I'm I'm trying to work with YouTube's face blur, uh, but it takes so long for it to edit the video, and uh, even after the it. it it supposedly did it for the first one that I uploaded. I went back to it and it still hadn't done it. So now I'm trying to work with like the custom blurring and I'm just trying to blur an entire section of the screen. Um, but I I don't know if that's gonna work. So I might not even post the first video, <laughs> uh, but we'll see what happens with that blurring from YouTube. Okay. All right, so, um, Welcome back. It's good to see uh, those of you that are here. Here, um, we are going to have our first real lecture today. Um, so let me share my iPad here. There we go. Okay. Um, so. The way that lectures uh, will be this year, um, as you know, you already saw, I hope uh, that on Monday I posted lectures for the sections 1.1 1 .1 and 1 1.2 from the textbook. Uh, every Monday I will post sort of those, those lectures of uh, the material for the week. Looking at the calendar, that means that next week I'll be posting uh, less lectures for sections 1, 3, 4, and 5. Um, so it, it's up to you to watch those on your own time, right? You, you can watch them whenever you want. And then Wednesday classes where we have this actual Zoom class, um, it'll be a time where I go through a bunch of problems from those sections. So hopefully you've already seen those, uh, those videos, but if not, you're gonna, you're gonna see just a lot of problems. Um, so uh, I have a list here of all the problems that I did last year. Uh, in the same format. So I'm actually going to do different problems. And uh, that way you'll be able to see the problems from this year uh, if you want, or you can go to last year's playlist and look at the problems that are different uh, from last year. They're from the same sections, but they're just different problems, right? So yes, hold on one second, please. Okay, oh I'm in class right now, so you need to go upstairs. But, and... my, but my water is empty. I'm so you're thirsty. so thirsty. Okay, yeah. just one second, please. She is so thirsty. How about you have some of daddy's? Yeah. Okay. Put lots of water in there. Oh, it's about as full as it can get, okay? You have not let much in. Well, I'd rather you not be thirsty. You. There you go. Dad, you know I need more when you. Right, did. and I've got a whole cup of coffee. So you go ahead. I'm I'm having the lecture right now, so you got to go out. Okay. What? Chloe, Chloe, I'm in the lecture, so you got to get out right now. Okay. 
Okay, bye bye. Love you. Mm -hmm. So, are there any questions? Uh, are there any questions about the way class will be? It'll basically just be, you know, lectures on Monday uh, that you can watch whenever you feel you need or can, and then problems on Wednesdays. Any questions about anything so far? It's not a yes. question. Is this your daughter super adorable? Yes, she is super adorable. Uh, yep, that's uh, that's Chloe. That's my oldest one. She's four and a half now, so she's in preschool with her mother, who is a she used to be a teacher, and so we're doing homeschool for preschooling. And uh, she's clearly skipping class right now. <laughs> so thank you for setting good examples and being here in class. Yeah, she's a whiz. Uh, I tell you what, she uh, she's she's been able to talk so well for years. It's 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 pretty amazing. My second daughter, Ava, who's two and a half, she at, at her age, Chloe was almost talking like she is now, but with you know her R's and her L's poor poorly miss or poorly pronounced. But Ava can't talk that well yet. So it's it's they're so different, you know. Um, so if there's no questions, um, just a couple of quick comments as well. Um, I, I see that I have some emails here, uh, that I got either from, uh, last night at like 5.30 and 6.30 or at noon yesterday. Um, so I, I will respond to those after class here today. Um, some of them definitely need to be followed up on here soon. So, uh, I've heard you, I'll get back to you after class here. Um, and then my last comment is we'll be testing out, we will be testing out polls today. Uh, and so we're gonna go ahead and try a poll right now. So I've never done this before. Um, I created questions before class and now I'm seeing that when I click the polls button, it does not even Hmm. Show them. So this is exactly why I have. Oh, no. This is that's really annoying. So you can create questions on Excel files and then upload them. So I created three questions earlier. The first one was just, are you a coffee drinker? Uh, and then there's some silly answers that you can give. And the next ones were actual problems from the book, but uh, I'm not seeing a way to access those right now. Okay, well, I'll have to figure that out. So um, here's what I'll do. I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna take a screenshot real quick of everyone that's in the chat or in the, uh, in, on the screen. Boom. And congratulations, you've all just attended class for the day. So <laughs> we'll just do it that way today until I can figure this out. So uh, attendance. What is the date? Two, three. Somebody uh, hit a staples button because that was easy. Hmm, that's really disappointing. Zoom. Ah, oh, well. Hmm. It looks like the only option is for me to click the poll button in the meeting and then it brings me to this poll editor where I can create a question. But there's nowhere where I can access my created questions. So that's pretty lame. 
Okay, well, that's enough time spent on that. So we'll go ahead and get back to the uh, to this. All right, so no questions. I've said everything I think we need to, um, and then we failed. So I, I don't even put an X there. That, that's a poor, poor thing. Okay, so next, we're going to just start doing problems from sections 1.1 and 1.2. Uh, so I might stop and ask you to, to work on a problem from time to time, or I might even just pose a question to you all. Um, so feel free to chime in. Um, you know, if, if this can be a little bit more interactive, that would be great. Uh, there were lectures last semester where it's just me sitting here doing problems and it was, you know, it, it's, it's what it was. I can do these problems all day long, but at the end of the day, that that's not what you're here for. It's, it's for you to be able to do these problems. So so last year I started off real easy with, with problems one and three. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, skip a couple of those because they're, they're pretty simple. Um, and we'll list, we'll start rather at number 10. So number 10 uh, gives a list of numbers. So the number 10 has 1.3. It has 1.3333 dot, dot, dot. Square root five, 5.34. Negative 500. One and two thirds as a mixed number. Root 16. 246 over two, excuse me, 579. And negative 20 over five. And then it asks us to label or list all of the natural numbers, which I will do in red. This fancy n means natural numbers. And then it asks us to do the integers, z, zollen, that's the German word for number, so integer. And we'll go uh, with different colors for rational and irrational, but we'll get there when we get there. So help me out, which of these are natural numbers? Um, would one of them be square root of 16? Yeah, square root of 16 is actually just four, right? So that's that's a natural number. Would 1.3 be a natural number? Mm, 1.3. So 1.3 has a decimal, right? So it's it's not actually a whole number. It's It's one and then three tenths. So it's not whole, it's, uh, it's got a fraction in there. So no, it's, it's actually not a natural number. The natural numbers are the whole numbers without zero. So when you look at that list, I think we found them all, right? Okay, the integers very similar, but you add zero and negative signs. So it includes all the natural numbers as well as the negatives and zero. So which of these are integers as well? Minus 500. Minus 500. Square root of 16. Square root of 16 again. Negative 20 over 5. Yep. That's also negative. That's negative 4. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Integers, just like natural numbers, don't allow for fractions that don't simplify to a whole number or a negative whole number. So that's it. Okay, now let's 
pick another nut color here and we'll go with the rational numbers. So the rational numbers use the fancy Q because Q is the first letter of quotient. A quotient. So when you look at these numbers, which of these are quotients? That means division problems or fractions. 1.3. Yeah. What is 1.3 as a quotient? Does anyone know? Okay, as a mixed number, that is correct. Uh, one and one, actually, that is not correct. One and one third is not correct. Excuse me. It's one and. I was looking at the next number. <laughs> this is the what place? Tenths. Tenths. And how many tenths do we have? Three. Three. So this is one and three tenths. Okay. Uh, as a as a not mixed fraction, this is thirteen tenths. Okay. Um, all right. So I, I misspoke earlier, and uh, I said that this was one and one third, and I sort of gave away the answer to the next one. This is also a rational number. Right. I, I hope you all recognize that one third equals 0.3 repeating forever. So we see that here, 0.3 forever. And then we've just added one to it. One plus one third is one and one third. So that is a rational number. Okay, so what are the other rational numbers on this list that we see? 5.34. One and two thirds. Yep. Four more. <laughs> at this, at this point, over 579. At this point, your guess is pretty, it's got a pretty high chance of being right. Three left. Maybe you can just pick out which one is not rational. Well, root five isn't, right? Correct. Five is a prime number. It's one times five. That's its only whole, uh, whole uh, factorization. It's only natural factorization. So it's irrational. Square root of a prime number is irrational. So negative 500 is actually a quotient. You could write it as negative 500 over one if you wanted. Square root 16 is rational. That's actually four over one. Negative 20 over five is rational as well. It's obviously what it is, a fraction there, okay? So notice how this sort of builds up. Every natural number is an integer and every integer is a rational, but it doesn't go backwards, right? The not every rational is an integer and not every integer is a natural number. Um, so, and there's one number that's on this list now uh, that doesn't belong to any of these. And that's square root five. That's an irrational number. There's no symbol for these. There was a proposal a long time ago to create a symbol for them. And somebody proposed, oh, let's create this cool looking I for irrational numbers. And there was a conference of hundreds and hundreds of smart math people who thought about it for an entire day and they said, it just doesn't seem rational. So we're not gonna use it. Square root five, irrational. Okay, so that's that. Identifying kinds of types of numbers. Uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, not one of the most practical things I would say, but there are definitely some practical aspects to it you know we in the in the world don't use things like natural numbers except to talk about like dollar bills 
right? Those are natural numbers. Yeah, go ahead. Um, can you explain how 246 over 579 is rational? Right, okay. Why is that rational? 246 over 579. So a rational number is defined as a ratio of two integers. So a rational number, if you look at the, the word, the root of this word is ratio, right? When you think of that word rational, a ratio is a fraction. It's a, it's a, you know, A over B. We need to make sure B is not zero, but if we just agree to never do that, um, we see that this is uh, just any old ratio. So if you can rewrite a number that you see, like we saw earlier, negative um, 500, it doesn't look like a ratio, but we can rewrite it as a ratio. If you can, if, if you can find one uh, that equals the number you're looking at, then you've got yourself a rational number. The number you asked, 279, 246 over 579, it's already actually in, and I can't remember numbers for the life of me, Two seven two four six over five seven nine. Doesn't matter what they are. Two four six over five seven nine. Um, I see two integers here, two hundred forty six and five hundred seventy nine, and they're in a fraction. They're in a ratio, right? So this is this fits the definition perfectly. It's the ratio of two integers. Okay. I have another question. Yeah, go ahead, shoot. I don't know if I'm like overthinking this, but in the textbook, it says that every real number has a decimal representation. Mm -hmm. And if it's rational, then the decimal is repeating. Yes. But for 246 over 579, is it repeating? Is it? That's a great question. Let's, I don't know if I have a calculator that has enough digits. So let me, uh, this isn't repeating it isn't, does it terminate? No. 246 over 579. Ooh, this is a good question. So there's not enough in Google's cal uh, calculator. Let me get a bigger calculator. This is always fun when you ask a, a math person, how many digits does your calculator go to? <laughs> uh, equals 246 over 579. Not that, you know, we compete at all with each other about things as trivial as that. Uh, how do I get more digits? So the answer is going to be it, uh, it definitely repeats. And the question is then how many digits do you need to go out to in order to see that? And I'm trying to find in Microsoft Excel, the decimal expansion. Cause you can't see it within the first, you know, 10 digits or whatever. but uh, it does. Okay, so 4248704663212144, and it keeps going. Well, that's no help. Um, it, it definitely would. I uh, can't tell you where it repeats to. Perhaps I can search that up later and I can provide you all with 
a better one here, 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 here. So here it is. This is this is point four two four eight seven zero four six six three two one two four three five two three three one six oh six two one seven six one six five eight oh three. And my goodness gracious, it doesn't repeat for a long, long time. Well, that's God, that's fascinating. I'm going to add that to the list of numbers to look into later. I guarantee it repeats. I, I can't see it within the first 20 or so digits, but it's here. It is definitely here somewhere. Um, I don't know if you are aware, but there is this amazing calculator out there called Wolfram Alpha. You just Google that. It, uh, it's a calculator that understands English. So you can type in entire math problems in English and it will attempt to solve them for you. It's, it's usually pretty right. Okay. It has 192 digits and then it starts repeating. Wolfram Alpha just thought that was a, a pertinent question. I'm just looking down. Hmm. So there you go. Okay, and then I've got a couple other questions. Can you go over how to tell the difference between rational and irrational? Yes. So again, uh, irrational numbers, it is impossible for you to write them as a fraction. So irrational numbers, it's impossible. There's no way for it to be done. Um, and it looks like I lost my, my screen sharing here. So let me get that back here. Okay, and we're back. Yeah, so the classic example is square root two. Um, there's a person that actually was killed over this fact. Um, he said that it was not a rational number and he proved it and he was considered a heretic at the time and he was thrown over the, over the edge of a boat while being tied to a, a bunch of rocks and he drowned. So you could look that up if you wanted to. Ugh ancient times. So fortunately today, we're not drowned over being heretics in that way. Um, but it's a classic example. If you try your best to write the square root of two as a fraction, you will fail every single time. There is no fraction that is exactly square root two. So that you'll always find in every decimal approximation of a uh, you'll always find a difference between what the decimal of root two is and whatever your fraction is. There's always going to be a difference. Um, if you can find a, uh, a fraction that equals, you know, some number that you suggest, like is some number, like a number N, is it a fraction? If you can find a fraction that equals it, it agrees at every decimal place then N is definitely rational. Okay. And another question is that if there's time during class, can I ask about a specific question from the homework? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, I've only like done one problem. So this is kind of sad. We're 30 minutes in. So I'll keep, I'll get back to the problems here. And, uh, and how about in two more problems, we can, we can get to your question about 1.1. So here we go. Uh, I was going to go into some practical uses of natural numbers and integers and things like that, but uh, I'm going to go forego that because that would just take some more time. Uh, as I look for the next problem, I'll say what I was going to say, but I won't write it. So dollar bills are a good example of natural numbers that are used every day. Dollar bills only uh, have integers that are positive, right? 1, 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, and of course the fake billion dollar bill. Um, negative numbers are 
really good um, for representing debt. So if you owe someone, you usually can write that as a negative number. Uh, if you owe someone five bucks, then the amount of money that you have is negative five, right? Um, so that's that. And rational numbers are used all the time for rates. When you're driving in your car and you see your speed of 30, that's actually 30 miles per one hour. So rational numbers come up all the time in real life as well. We just maybe don't think of them uh, that way. All right. So here is the first, uh, the second question. What property of the real numbers is being used here? Three plus seven is the same as seven plus three. This is question 11. Commutative property. Commutative, yep. We've just commuted or moved the numbers around. Very good. All right, how about this one? Four times two plus three is equal to two plus three times four. I see the answer distribution property. Have we actually distributed anything? Distribution would mean that we've multiplied this through. But have we? I lost my water. You lost your water. Okay, you need to ask mommy to go find it for you because well, daddy's working see, still. See, mommy's trying to get notice to me. Then you need to ask your sister to help you. Well, Here, see, uh, take take little Snakey to help you, okay? But He's she, got a good sniffer. Well, I have a good sniffer. Okay, well, go find He's it. Okay. Just a will, he says something that, that could, like, All right. Uh, so not the distributive property. It's also not the associative property. Associative means we're doing things, uh, we're doing different operations in uh, a chosen order. But this has more to do with uh, moving things. It's commutative, actually. Okay, so we've actually swapped the order of the multiplication, haven't we? So addition is commutative and so is multiplication. We're commuting here. We've, we've swapped the order of our multiplication. So associative property would be uh, like this. Let's say you have four times two times three. So you need to do that multiplication. So first you say, oh, I'm going to multiply the four and the two to get eight and then multiply by three to get 24. Associative property, the associative property says that you can do that in the other order too, which is without changing the list, four, two, three is still four, two, three. Instead, you're going to do this multiplication first and then the other. So that's the associative property. Transitive property is this. Um, uh, mm, let's, let me think of a, a funny example here. Transitive says if A equals B and if B equals C, then A equals C, right? It's like a logical statement. If this means this and this means this, then the first and the last thing must be true. Uh, I'm going to forego finding a funny one there. Okay. Um, so here's the next one. Uh, X plus 2Y in a group plus 3Z equals 
x plus 2y plus 3z. What property do we have here? The associative property? Yes and yes. Yep. We haven't changed the list. X, 2y, 3z. X, 2y, 3z. So it's not commutative. We haven't distributed. So, so there's no distribution happening here. Uh, there's no, there's not two separate statements implying a third. So it's not transitive. Uh, this is just association. Right. And this is something that everybody does just naturally, you know, I, uh, uh, for my daughters, I have like a, a penny jar or a coin jar. I'm sure all of you know what I'm talking about, just a, a cup or a, a bottle or something that you just put your spare change in. And uh, eventually you have to count it. So what do you do? You, you count up your pennies, you count up your nickels, you count up your dimes, and you, call, you count up your bills. And then in order to know how much money you have, you add them all up, right? I don't know about you, but I can't add four numbers together in my head all at the same time, like simultaneously. So what I usually do is I add the penny amount to my nickels. I take that result and I add it to my dimes. And then I add that to the bills. I start from the bottom and go up. So we commonly associate because we can only do two things. We can only add two things together at one time with our brains. Um, maybe some of you have like two brains and you can add like three things together at the same time. I don't know who I'm talking to, but that, that would be sweet. Um, maybe you knew that 246 over 579 has 192 decimals before repeating. I didn't, but this is the associative property. Okay, well, we're gonna skip a few Skip a few here and get to some more difficult problems. Um, uh, okay, let's just talk about some inequalities. Um, so I want you to think about this phrase, x is positive, and I want you to think about how you would write this using symbols x is positive. How do you use inequalities to write that out? Would it just be x is greater than zero? Boom, that's it. x greater than zero. Can anyone think of a different way to write it using the same three symbols? Yeah, Michaela, go ahead. Zero is less than x. Yeah, zero is less than x. Means the same thing. Okay, there's other ways too. X plus one is greater than one for sure, right? If you add one to X, it's definitely gonna be bigger than one. But you could change these two things that we have here in any way that you want using operations we've learned and uh, you'll be fine. Because if this is true, then that means this is true and the reverse also holds. So they're equivalent expressions. Very good. Okay, next one. Uh, t, t is less than four. This one is literally word for word how you should say T less than for word for word, it's literally that. So I'm gonna just write that and have it there. I'm gonna skip to the harder one. Not C, that one's too easy. D, oh, this is question, uh, this is question 39, by the way, from the text, if you're following along, question 39. Uh, X is less than one third and greater than 
negative five. So I want you on a piece of paper to try and put a guess down for what you think this is. I'll give you a few seconds, but I want this as just one, one string. It should only be, you know, to the two numbers an X and a couple other symbols. That's right, Michaela. Okay, so Michaela gave us the correct answer in the chat. This is what's called a compound inequality. So usually the way you write these is you put the smallest number on the left, the biggest number on the right. The correct signs here either less than or equal to or whatever. Um, and then your variable in the middle. It's very, very similar to interval notation. Right, you've got your boundaries. The parentheses tell you if it's possibly equal to the endpoints or not. And then your variable is somewhere in between there. Okay, good job, Nina and, and Michaela. You both got it there in the chat. Great job. Okay, the hardest one. The distance from P, so that's just some number, to three is at most five. The distance from P to three is at most five. I see Mariah literally scratching her chin right now. Yeah, this is a tough one. I'm not sure, but would it be like D is less than or equal to five or? Right, so we've got a distance is less than or equal to five. But what do we, how do we compute D using P and three? Would we use absolute value? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so would it be P minus three? Yes. Great, um, less than or equal to five? Yes, yes, we, we, yeah, yeah, so, the distance between two numbers can be found by taking the difference of them, plugging that into the absolute value function, and you've got it. Great job. So the absolute value of P minus three, that tells you how far apart those two numbers are, is at most five. So it's, at, it's less than or equal to five. Great job. Okay, um, there's you know several other kinds of problems throughout this section. Uh, none of them are e exceptionally difficult. Uh, there's some with absolute values in them. Uh, there's some with unions and intersections of sets. Uh, those aren't aren't too difficult. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and pass the the baton off to the student that had the question earlier. Uh, it was Nina. So you asked if you could ask a question about one of the 1.1 homeworks. So go ahead. On, uh, I mean, I don't know if the like homework changes for everyone, but it was number five on mine in 1.1. Okay. 1.1. Number five, the numbers do change. Um, that is okay. Oh, oh, uh, you just saw this question, right? The one that we just did. The distance from P to three is at most five, right? So this right here is your big, your big help. 
So if you have any two numbers, any two real numbers, so pick A is a real number, B is a real number. So they're both inside the real numbers. The distance between A and B, it's always, always, always equal to the absolute value of B minus A, or you can flip that around, okay? So A minus B, it's no different because of the absolute values definition. So you pick any two real numbers, A and B, take one of them minus the other one, and then get rid of any negative signs that come up. And that'll tell you how far apart they are. So a good example is negative nine and two. Here's zero. So how far apart are they? Well, we can do this in any order we want. Negative nine minus two is negative 11. Take the absolute value. It's 11. You can see that here just by sort of counting distances to zero. That's obviously nine away. And this is obviously two away. So that together is 11. That is visible from the subtraction in the other order. Two minus a negative nine oops, is equal to two plus nine, which is the absolute value of 11, which is just 11. All right, I understand now, thank you. Good, 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 good. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and skip to section 1.2 unless there's other questions. One point two is the more difficult of the two sections, I would say. Okay, one point two was on uh, exponentials and radicals. Okay, so last year I really tried to get at the basics, and I answered the first basically the first six questions with the students. Those are like the, the simplest questions. Um, so um, I'll, I'll ask one of them again. I hope that's okay. Um, five times five times five times five. How can you write this as an exponential? Five to the fourth. Why do you know it's five to the fourth power? Because there's four fives. Yeah, this is, the, this is just the definition of an exponential is you've got a base that is m repeatedly multiplied together. The number of times you see it, so one, two, three, four, that is the power of the base. Okay, that is, is sort of a really simple definition because it doesn't really work for things like this. Right? Um, and it, it certainly doesn't work for things like this, but these are exponentials and this is totally allowed. Uh, but in a simple way, this is the nice way to think about exponentials. It's repeated multiplication and it, it simplifies the writing of the, ex, uh, of the multiplication in, in a big way. So let's go ahead and skip to um, several of these. Um, so this is number nine. I want us to write the square root of three as an exponential. What is the square root of three as an exponential? Yeah, most of us don't think of radicals as exponentials. 
Um, is it three to the one half power? It is with confidence, Samantha. With confidence, you got it. Three to the one half power. Yes, that's exactly it. Okay. Yeah, it's it's one of these weird things. Uh, if you've got an nth root of some number, that's actually the one over nth power of that base. Number 10. The third root of seven squared. What is that equal to as a as an exponential? How could you? Would that be seven to the two thirds power? Yeah. Yes. Seven to the two thirds power. Yes. So that actually gives you a, a hint at something. Um, I said this is difficult to imagine as repeated multiplication, right? Five to the one point three or some decimal. Well, so long as you can write that exponential as a fraction, it gives you an idea of what that looks like here, you know, in terms of some root of some power of a base. Yeah, so how did you get that? You probably wrote it like this, according to this rule right there. And then you used the powers of the properties of powers, which says if you've got a, an exponential raised to a power that is equal to the exponential where the power is, the new power is the product of the old powers so two times one third the base stays the same the powers are multiplied okay um let's go in the other direction for it's number 11 four to the three halves power. This one you, you could simplify if you wanted to. I'll accept that answer. That's totally fine. Uh, but I want you to write this as a as a uh, either a whole number or I want you to rewrite it using radicals, if that makes sense. You can go two ways with this and I'll accept either way. Okay, I'll go ahead and get us started. So the first thing I usually think about uh, is how can I break that power up into a product so that things sort of simplify and make more sense, you know, in a fast way. And the way I see three halves is three times one half with the one half on the left, because I know that rule that we just applied up here. If you've got a product in a power, you can break it up into, you know, this associative thing, four to the one half power to the third power, you can do that. Now four to the one half power, that's the same as the square root of four to the third power. But we all know the square root of four is just two. So this is two cubed, which is eight. You could, you could, you could, you could do this a different way, right? Four to the third power to the one half power. 
and that's fine. It's just that you need to know your cube of four, which is 64. Yeah, four times four is 16. 16 times four is 64. And then you need to know your square root of 64, which of course is eight. So there's, there's two separate ways to go about this. Um, the knowledge of going back and forth between radicals and exponentials, that's the thing that I'm looking for here. It wasn't necessarily the getting to the root eight. I have a quick question. Yes. Can we also write it where under the square root it's four to the third power? Yes. Yep. Yeah, that's that's this one here. That's actually this one. Parentheses, or do we need to include that when we're showing our work? Oh, I see. Um, yeah, you know, <clears throat> when you're showing your work, if you if you get to this step here, that I've just it's up at the top of the screen, right? If you get to this step and you you do that computation. So instead of writing the square root of four cubed, instead you write the square root of 64. I'm totally fine with the either one. That those are both the same. Uh, you as a student will probably prefer this form from time to time because you won't know exactly like if you get something like the square root of, you know, like 52 cubed like that's ridiculous you're you're not going to compute that <laughs> so don't so please don't take the time to do that don't even take the time to put it into a calculator you know just there's your answer done <laughs> okay so you just leave it if you could simplify maybe i should have picked a prime number uh let's go with 50 53 uh, perhaps 53 so the let's pick a, a crazy big number. Um, well, let's not. Let's go with just fifty-three cubed, and let's make this like the fourth root. So it's even uglier, right? Um, if you get something like this where uh, you can't simplify it at all, please don't compute that number fifty-three cubed and replace it with, you know the fourth root of whatever 53 cubed is. It's a big number. Just, just to keep it there. Other questions? Okay, so we're gonna do one more of these just for, just for practice. Um, it is this one. It is change this number into a radical form or into its radical form. So a to the two fifths. Anyone? Uh, would it be the fifth root of a to the second power? That's right. Okay. Fifth root of a squared totally works. Is there another possible answer? There is. What is it?
Is it just the fourth root of A? Uh, not the fourth root. No. So I see in order to get from here to here, uh, they thought of it like this, two to the one fifth or two times one fifth. And then they thought of it like this, they grouped it that way. But what about an alternative ordering? Yeah, I'll just write it down here. There's an alternative to doing this. Instead of two times one fifth, you could have one fifth times two. That's totally fine. The product is commutative, so we can do that. And using the rule we know, this means that we can turn it into that. All right, there's this rule that says if you've got a to the m power to the nth power, that's the same as a to the m times n. So we can just sort of, you know, group things however we want in the in problems like this. So this a to the one fifth, that's the fifth root of a, not a squared. It's the fifth root of a, and then we square the whole thing. And you could at this point, I guess, get rid of these parentheses if you wanted and just say it's that fifth root squared. It's a little different. It has to do with what you do first, right? If you were to do this with a calculator, um, this one up here, you would take the number, you would square it. It's the first thing you would do. The second thing is you would take the fifth root of it. Whereas down here, the first thing you would do is take the fifth root. The second thing you would do is square it. Okay. So if A were a negative number, um, and if this were a an even root, uh, you wouldn't be able to you wouldn't be able to do the second one down here, but you could do this one because squaring a negative number gets rid of the negative sign. So then you can take the even root. Um, so there's benefits actually of doing one or the other first. But yeah, there's two possibilities for that. Okay. I think one of you, maybe a couple of you got that, uh, uh, get the powers and the radicals pretty well. But it, it seems to me that um, uh, we, could, we could definitely work more on that. So, Let's go with some numerical examples to, to work on this a little more. Root three, this is question 25. Yeah, okay, 25. So root three times root 15. I'm gonna walk us through this with just, uh, you know, explicitly mentioning all of the rules that we use um, as we go through this. So there's this nice little rule that we have hopefully read or seen the movie on uh, or will. Uh, and if you haven't, here's the nice rule. It says that if you have um, a product of things to some power, that's the same as the product of the powers of the factors. So if you can if you can rewrite a number into its factors. So in this problem we've got a 15 there. 15 factorizes into 3 times 5. Okay, so we've we've just converted 15 into this form. Now it's a, a product to a power. If we can do that, then we can rewrite it with this rule by applying the power individually to each factor. 
So we see the square root of three times five. We can rewrite that as the square root of three times the square root of five. So we saw this, we saw this radical was applied to a product. This rule says that we can split that up into a product of the radicals, the product of the square roots. There is no equivalent rule for addition. Okay, this only works with products. There is no equivalent rule for sums. All right, so this, if this were a plus sign, we would not be able to do this. This only works for products and quotients and quotients. Okay. But we can also apply this rule in reverse. If we see the same power, right? Notice these have the same power, M and M. If we see a product of two things that have the same power, we can in reverse write it as the power of just the product, right? That one power of the product of the two things. So down here, I, I bring that up because we see the square root of three and the square root of three. They both have the same power, the square root. It's one half, right? So we can rewrite that as the square root of three times three. You can sort of shift things around here. And I say that because we all know that the square root of nine is three. So this whole thing just simplifies to three times the square root of five. And we're just rinsing and repeating using this rule over and over again. Yes, Nina, very good. Yeah, Michaela. Why do we put the three on the outside? Yeah, you know, it's, it's one of these things um, is this is a great question. You know, back in high school and in grade school, we're, we're taught to like simplify things as much as we can, right? Simplify, simplify. It's like, I hope I spelled that right. Simplify, simplify. It's like this, you know, standing order that we're given from the age of six. You have to simplify every answer. The, what's the big deal, right? <laughs> why, why do we have to write that as three root five? Uh, the short answer is computationally, a simplified answer is easier to compute. It, it involves fewer steps to do. Okay, so if I right now asked you to, you know, get a calculator and find out what this is, you would have to do a you know, a, a, a number of things. You would have to type three and then type square root. And it would give you an approximation of the square root of three, an approximation. But that's a prime number. So that's an irrational decimal. So it has an infinite number of decimals. So you would probably write down, you know, one point and then like 20 decimals to try and be as accurate as possible. The next thing you do is you do the same thing for square root of 15, but the square root of 15 is also irrational. So you would write down an approximation, three point, you know, 20 decimals. You know, in order to do that, you'd have to approximate these two numbers. But in the simplified version, you only do one approximation. You take three times, this, square root of five, the square root of five is two point something. So you would approximate that and multiply it by three. So that's the long answer. The short answer is uh, simplified answers are easier to compute. They take fewer steps. The long answer is there's actually fewer approximations and there's actually more accuracy involved in computing a simplified answer. Um, when a calculator is going to do it all for you anyway, you know, it doesn't really make much of a difference. 
for those of you out there that are engineers, this can make a, a big difference uh, depending on how accurate your approximations are. Um, you know, when you're computing stress or uh, uh, the load characteristic of a certain beam in a, in a big building, you know, you better, you better be rounding things to like a hundred decimal places because when, when the order of magnitude of the mass of the thing that that beam is supporting, when the order of magnitude is, you know, <laughs> thousands of kilograms, you know, uh, decimal places to the fourth or fifth or sixth place start to really make a difference. <laughs> so as few approximations as possible uh, really goes a long way uh, in, in things like engineering. And if you're a computer scientist, if, if you're going into computer science and writing programs, the fastest program wins the day. And the fastest program computes things in the simplest possible way. So, uh, so there you go, there's that. That's the really, really long version of why we write things like this, three times root five. Um, Mathematically, you know, this is how we did it using the rule. Practically speaking, why do we do this? And why do your, why did your teachers tell you to simplify things for, you know, the last 20 years? That's why we're, we're just talking about the practical co computation of, of things. That's it. Is that a satisfactory answer? Um, here we go. Uh, this is question 47. Yeah. Okay. 47. And we've still got eight minutes. So we're good. 47. The sixth root of 64 a to the sixth b to the seventh. Simplify. This is a harder problem, but only because it involves more applications of the same rule. So it's 64 times A to the sixth times B to the seventh. Question 47. So the first thing you should probably do is think about splitting this up. We've got a product. So let's split this up into several roots. So this would be like the sixth root, 64, times the sixth root of a to the sixth, times the sixth root of b to the seventh. What's the next step? What do you think? There's there's several, but what do you think a next step could be? Um, isn't a six um over six basically to um a one? So you don't yes. Have to, you get some on it. Yeah, that's right, Alex. Yeah. So first thing we can do is just remember that this is this here is a to the sixth to the one sixth power. Right? We convert the root into a fractional power. And then we remember our rule, which says that if you've got an exponential to a power, you can multiply the powers together. And six times one sixth is one. So this is just a to the first or just a. Okay. So we've now just turned this into the sixth root of 64 times a 
times the sixth root of b to the seventh. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes. Let's let's think about that. What is two times two times two times two times two times two? Four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four. Two to the sixth power is sixty-four. So I'm gonna erase that. Write it like this. And then for the same reason, we turned the sixth root of a to the sixth to just a. For the same reason, we're going to just rewrite that as two. Should we change the, the last one? Can we change the last one? This one's a little bit less obvious. The answer, the short answer is yes. Um, so one way to think about it is this b to the seventh is b times 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 b. Six b's multiplied together times one b. Another way to write that is the sixth root of b to the sixth times b and then we'll split that radical up like that. And then we've got our result 2 a b times the sixth root of b. I have a question. Go ahead. Can you repeat how you got the two again? I'm confused on that part. Yeah. So someone out there, I don't remember who it was, but someone out there knows their powers of two like a boss. And they just remembered off the top of their head that 64 is the same as two to the sixth power. That person is, they know their powers of two. That's good. So when we saw, when they saw the sixth root of 64, they said to themselves, oh, I know that's two to the sixth. So this is the sixth root of two to the sixth. And then we have that rule that says, well, the, the sixth root is the same as the one sixth power. And then when we have a, an exponential raised to a power, what we can do is keep the base the same and raise it to the product of those powers. Right, and six times one sixth, that's just one. Got gotcha. you. There you go. So final answer here, the overall simplification of this problem, of our starting problem, is just two AB times the sixth root of B. All right, we've got like one minute left. Um, so thank you for everybody that came today. Um, uh, I will go ahead and take one more screenshot just to make sure I didn't miss anybody from the beginning. Uh, I will try and figure out what went wrong with the poll. Um, while you were working, I went online and was looking at the polls. It says I have not created any polls yet, but I, I did. So I don't, I don't know. I think there's an issue with, because I did it on Blackboard and the Zoom polls look like it's pulling from the Zoom website. I think that's probably the problem, but I'll sort that out for next time. If your name appears on the screen right now, I'll count you as here today. So uh, 
according to the attendance policy, you're good for today. Okay, so thank you for coming. It's great to see you all. Uh, uh, thank you for being so uh, understanding of the interruptions earlier. Um, so <laughs> uh, I hope it wasn't a big deal for you. Um, but I will see you again next Wednesday. Uh, I'll post lectures Monday. There's no, no meeting time on Monday, just a meeting on Wednesday. Uh, homework is due next Monday. Um, that's the homework for sections 1.1 and 1.2. Um, there's no quiz this Friday. Uh, the quizzes start next Friday. And uh, if you have any questions on 1.1 and 1.2, stop by office hours tomorrow afternoon uh, at 1.45 to 3. I didn't have anyone yesterday. Um, so I had homework time for myself. So, uh, you know, that, that's never a bad thing, but it's for you. So if you have questions, stop by office hours or drop me an email. Um, and I, I'll help you out. For those of you that emailed me, I am going to get to my emails right now. So, uh, so I'll respond to you here in just a few minutes. Okay. Thank you for coming. It's good to see you. And I hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Giovanna or Louis, did you have a, a question? Okay, it looks like maybe you stepped away. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the meeting. I'll see you guys next time, all right?